Welcome to the Poison Pen, and um, it's exciting, as it always is, for us to be introducing a debut author, Allison Epstein, who is with us today on the left. Wave, Allison. Hey. Hi. Um, has a wonderful book called A Tip for the Hangman. You can see a copy here. Our autograph copies are somewhere probably lost in a blizzard in Chicago, but eventually, <laughs> I know how that is because I grew up in Winnetka. <laughs> Oh, do I remember. Um, anyway, um, at some point, they will wend their way to us here in Scottsdale, and I urge you to buy one. It's always always a good idea to buy the first novel by a promising author, especially if it's an autographed copy. And with us today to host is Susanna Calkins, who has written, let's see, I wrote all the stamps, I wouldn't screw it up, uh, The Lucy Campion Mysteries, and out now, uh, in January, no, February, early February, is The Sign of the Gallows, which is the most recent one, 17th century England. And Susanna has also ventured into more modern territory, if you could call it that, with the Speakeasy Mysteries. And then she's, she's got um, a collection of things on her website, which I do not know, which are called Cozy Case Files. So at some point, Susanna, perhaps you can explain to us what the Cozy Case Files is, because that was truly new to me. So, Susanna is an historian and educator currently at work. I brought my hat so I could do this. Ta-da! My Northwestern hat. She is currently at Northwestern University. And Allison, who writes as a co works as a copywriter in Chicago, marketing copywriter, sorry, is a Northwestern graduate. So, who knew that today I should have worn purple, but this is the best <laughs> I can do. Hi. Northwestern is distinct for its purple color, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the most flattering color in the world, but absolutely distinctive. I and mean, if you travel with Northwestern, which my husband and I thing <laughs> to do it. So um, Susanna is going to be talking to Allison about a tip for the hangman, and we are dropping back into Elizabethan England, and particularly the life of Christopher Kit Marlowe, whom many of you may have heard about as a dramatist, you may not be so familiar with his rumored career as a spy for Sir Francis Walsingham, who really started, if you think about it, really started MI5, didn't he? More or less. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he really did with his intelligencers and so forth. Um, so there's much about Christopher Marlowe that we will never know, which is really unfortunate because he, he crammed a lot of living into a relatively short life. But I'm sure you're going to tell us more about it. So, Susanna, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and, you know, I got I got to read uh, Allison's book pretty early on, so I was excited, especially when I saw some uh, interesting parallels with work I've done. Um, but, Allison, um, I was curious if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about A Tip for the Hangman. I mean, what's the story about? Can you kind of set the scene for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, A Tip for the Hangman is kind of half historical fiction, half spy thriller, is how I've been describing it. Um, and uh, as, as we said earlier, it is about the life of Kit Marlowe, who is well known, I mean, as far as poets and playwrights are ever well known. He's, he's well known for his, his writing. Uh, he was a contemporary of Shakespeare, so he was moving around in that, that kind of circle. But at the same time, we also have pretty reasonably good historical evidence that he was working as a spy for Queen Elizabeth I. The details of that spy work are, are sketchy, as, as details of spy work often are. If you're a good spy, we usually don't know a whole lot about what you did. So in A Tip for the Hangman, I kind of use a little bit of historical fiction and creative license to imagine what Marlowe's spy career might have been. And based on all of the wonderful things that came together in my research and timing and everything. Um, a lot of the imagined spy career that I created for him is about um, the, the schemes by Mary Queen of Scots to unseat Queen Elizabeth from the throne. And mm -hmm. that, after I read your book a few weeks ago, you also do quite a bit of dealing with Mary Queen of Scots, so I was delighted to see that. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm so curious. I mean, how did you come up with the idea? I mean, have, is this a time period you've always been interested in? Was it Marlowe himself that you were like? What what brought you to sort of think about this book in the first place? Yeah, I I was an English major as an undergrad, and so I've always been um, the the stereotypical Shakespeare nerd. I will I will spend my time watching any production of Hamlet you can find for me. And so when I was getting my my English degree, I kind of gravitated toward that kind of 
coursework. And in one of those classes, I was introduced to Marlowe as, you know, one of the other people writing at this time. And I don't think my professor meant for me to get quite so interested as I did during that lecture. But I, I you know, he gave me the quick overview of a few facts. This is an Elizabethan poet. He was probably a spy. He was probably gay. He was probably a heretic. He was also murdered at 29. And I kind of just went off on that, <laughs> that research tangent. Yeah. And uh, many, many years later, this, this book was the result. I just fell in love with him as a character. I, I, I couldn't leave him alone after I started researching him. I want to ask you about that, but I'm curious, uh, did you ever tell that professor that like you inspired an entire novel out of this like passing reference in a lecture? Did you let him know? <laughs> uh, I actually did an event yesterday at that college and I gave him a shout out. So oh, nice. Now he knows all his <laughs> so he knows now? Like in the, in <laughs> he knows now. He didn't know before. I didn't I make yeah. sure I was going to work. Yeah, well, I can't imagine as an educator to know like you just have this sort of passing reference and someone creates a whole novel that is so intriguing. That's, that's you gotta fantastic. watch what you say around <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> what was that like for you to, uh, I mean, I'm actually curious, you mentioned some sources that you had um, about, I mean, I guess I'm sort of interested, especially in like Marlowe as a spy. I mean, sort of a, it sounds like that was kind of like things people might have known about him. I mean, just generally, what kind of like research did you do or like what kind of sources did you use? Yeah, um, the fun thing about Marlowe's spy career is that there are some primary sources from the period and I reference a few of them throughout the book uh, to kind of as like Easter eggs for the Marlowe enthusiasts. There's a, a relatively well-known note from Elizabeth I's Privy Council and kind of sending a note to his university professors at the time saying, I know Marlowe's been absent from class a lot. He's been doing secret state business just oh, cool. That's not a problem. And so that's a real document that is kind of the basis of most of the Marlowe spy theories. I love it. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's, is there like a Marlowe society, by the way? Is there like a secret Marlowe society? I mean, I'm, I'm just curious if there's like Marlowe. Because you mentioned Marlowe. There is actually yes. a Marlowe society. <laughs> There, you can start that one. <laughs> you could. That's awesome. Can I interrupt and, and ask you to ground us a little bit in the spy work by talking to us about Sir Francis Wals Walsingham, because he really was the spy master. And I'm, my impression is that it was inspired, his getting together this group um, by Mary Queen of Scots, not so much the Queen herself, but all the other people. I, I've never been entirely sure how active she was as a player as compared to whether she was a pawn of, um, I mean, she was a really unlucky person. That's the first thing to remember yes. about Mary Queen of Scots is uh -huh. she was not only unlucky, but she had really bad judgment and the combination was and a, a killer. But, you know, well. she married off well to, to the Dauphin in France and then, you know, Lordy died before, um, you know, anything. Her whole life got derailed and I'm not sure she ever fully recovered from that. Um, it, you know, I think her life is, is tragic, but also a series of bad choices led her to a place. I find it fascinating. She and Elizabeth lie side by side in Westminster Abbey. You know, yeah, I mean, sure if you go, Elizabeth you know, the two of them in that. proximity. <laughs> but anyway, because of the, you know, the, the whole um, threat that Mary posed as a legitimate child, as opposed to the oh. illegitimate, but legitimate, well, not really illegitimate, but anyway, tenuous claim of Elizabeth. Sir Francis Walsingham was appointed, or somehow or other became, um, the spy master. He also had a daughter who I think is fascinating, but we won't go there. Uh, but anyway, tell us about Walsingham, because you must have run into him, uh, and he would have been the one that Marlowe worked for if Marlowe was, in fact, doing spy work. Yeah, I am a big Francis Walsingham fan. I find him Me too. fascinating. And the, the original intelligence master of England. I think we were talking just before this call that Walsingham kind of invented MI5. He's the original espionage guy, and so I'm a big fan of him. Um, and definitely the, the big plot of his earlier tenure was Mary Queen of Scots, who had all kinds of, you know, secret machinations all across Europe. She was in conversation with the King of Spain. She was trying to recruit an entire army secretly, sending coded messages all over the continent. And so with that kind of, you know, infrastructure against you, Elizabeth must have known, I, I need to step up my game so that I can stop this plot before it gets out of hand. And that was more or less Walsingham's job. 
he was also um, the uh, Queen's royal secretary, sort of like secretary of state. Mm -hmm. So he had his hand in all kinds of different um, European plots throughout the time. So that kind of made him the perfect guy to get a little bit deeper in the in the underground side of things. And in the book, I do have Kit Marlowe work really, really closely with Walsingham. It's actually Walsingham who comes to Cambridge and recruits Kit right at the beginning of the book. And so they have a, a very, I would say, love-hate relationship. I think they learn to work with each other, but they, there is a clash of personalities, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I really, I think you would do a really great job of bringing these uh, characters to life. I mean, and they, they seem really you know, vivid and, you know, and I, which is, it's just so intriguing, you know, how they, you know, I mean, like the, you know, they're bringing in sort of mathematicians and, and I mean, I, although as it, I, well, hmm, I never want to give away spoilers, but uh, so what do you want to say about the, like, how much do you want to say about, uh, like, maybe Babington and, uh, the, um, or not? <laughs> I am, I am happy to talk about it because I find it incredibly interesting. And also, I think most people who, who know of Mary Queen of Scots know that it ended badly. So okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's not a spoiler, spoiler in the beheading. I'm so sorry if you did not know this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just curious, like, I mean, you know, it's, uh, well, uh, just as a really quick side note to my own book, um, this is why it was so interesting when I was reading Allison's, um, you know, and I got the chance to read it ahead of time, is that I was working on the one that just came out now, and this, uh, um, the Sign of the Gallows. And the Sign of the Gallows is, referencing to this Babington plot, this cipher between Mary, um, Queen of Scots and, and uh, Ben Babington, who was her co-conspirator, a Jesuit priest, I believe. And, you know, so the sign of the gallows was one of these ciphers that is still in the 17th century. They're still using this code. <laughs> so it carries on, even though apparently it was a really bad code that everybody, you know, was able to break. Because I think it was like a fairly simple substitution cipher from what I kind of can glean. It's really hard for me to capture all the nuance on that um but did you um like to uh, did you did you think about um like when you were kind of researching that aspect of like sort of ciphers and codes i mean you know did you did you look into that very much or like you know how like what's it what, what were you what kind of research did you do around how they came up with that stuff or yeah i spent a lot of time with the the deciphered letters which i found super interesting. I think you, you actually had a nod to this in your book and it made me laugh out loud because I had the same reaction is that as soon as you crack the code of Mary and Babington's letters, they're the most incriminating documents you have. <laughs> I know, they're awful. They're like, so here's how we're going to bring along the army and like, oh. <laughs> and then we shall defeat the usurping Queen Elizabeth. I'm like, you guys didn't try at all, did you? You were really depending on this work. So uh, that was, that was, what really interested me is how, how brazen they were about it. As far as the code itself, I do not have a mathematical mind. And so like, I find deciphering codes fascinating and it interests me from a personal level. I think if I wanted to become a cryptographer, cryptologist, whichever yeah. it is, it would take me a decade to break the oh, yeah. simplest code in the world. So I, I created a code for my book, and it was really hard. I was like, I'm yeah. tech, so I was trying to keep it accurate. I was like, this is hard work, and I was like, just su pretty simple substitution, double substitution, <laughs> um, not like the really complex mathematical ones, which are really right. hard. The way I got around that is, um, I thought Kit Marlowe would be a good cryptographer. He has kind of, I mean, the way that uh, you play with language, you know multiple languages, you play with words and meaning. It seems like a good way for him to get involved in spycraft, and so that's why in the book I give him kind of the code decipherer role, but I also made him very new to it, and so he's kind of figuring it out as he goes, and he also doesn't really know how it works, which author tip is a great way to do it if you don't know how to read a code. <laughs> Have your character figure it out with you. I think that's fan fantastic. Um, you mentioned some of the language. I mean, I'm curious. You had fantastic turns of phrase, and I actually had written them and then I forgot them. But I, I don't know if you can remember any of them. But you had like a lot of those, what we might say, like you know, by gosh now or something, you know, whatever. Like, well, but there was a lot of really fun ones. Um, does does any kind of come to mind? Um, you know, some. I mean, like how like, well, how like you Elizabethan come up? cursing, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, what if you by the nails of Christ or something like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, how did you, um, how did you go about, like, I mean, you, I think you do a really nice job of kind of sprinkling in these great phrases and terms and uh, without it being inaccessible to the reader. Um, 
which is, you know, great, right? Like, you don't, we, we can't. They had a very weird exclamation that you could tell was clearly standing in for what would have been a modern curse word if it was written in 2020. I just, I loved those. And so that was part of the, the voice of the time that I wanted to keep in there. But as, as far as language goes, you're right that I was trying to walk a pretty narrow line for this book. Mm -hmm. I, want, I didn't want it to feel distractingly anachronistic, but at the same time, I wanted it to feel like these are Elizabethans who could also be modern people. I wanted it to feel accessible and I wanted it to feel of the moment. And so it was a, a careful balancing act of, is this turn of phrase, does that sound too much like 2018 when I was writing it? Or does that sound so archaic that it kind of jumps out from everything else? We, my copy editor and I had lots of fun discussions about. <laughs> was there one in particular, like you can remember, like they, they like or didn't like or, <laughs> you know? Um, there, there were several times we went back to the historical thesaurus and we were oh. arguing about the first time that a word, it, I, I can't remember a specific one, but I remember getting really defensive about some of them. I'm like, no, but the, all of the alternatives for this word are so weird. Yeah. <laughs> if I go for the accurate word, everyone's going to be staring at that word for 20 minutes because no yeah. one like that. So. No, I know. It's a real balance, right? Because yeah. you, can't, you can't be so, sometimes you can't have it so spot on that people are like, I don't believe that, or, you know, because you don't want to take them out of the story, but you also don't want it to be like, hmm, that's modern, nobody would say that. I mean, it's a, it is a tricky balance there, uh, which I, th I thought you did beautifully, um, and I thought, you know, I actually really thought as a thriller, it was, it was really well paced and, you know, quick, you know, so I thought that was, that was really nice. Did you... Um, I know you have a background in writing now, but did you like was how did you kind of consciously build your pace or how did you think about the writing process? Was that Yeah, um this book taught me how to pace as mm -hmm. a writer. And you can really, really tell the difference between the first draft of this book and the one that is on shelves now because the first draft is twice as long and you know, kind of meanders all over the place and it wanted to be a thriller but it didn't know how. Mm -hmm. and so as I, I was really committed to making this book work and kind of as an exercise in that, I was like, okay, we're going to have to figure out how to piece it. Mm -hmm. so there yeah. were many different rounds of revisions of just moving scenes over here, condensing timelines, moving things around to make it have that, that thriller beat while also kind of keeping to the historical timeline of when things actually happened and how long it took. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of there were many nights of just moving note cards around on the floor, trying to get the pace to be right. Mm -hmm. And how, how long did it take you to write the book? I'm always just so curious because, you know, a lot of us take a long time, that first book. And was this your first book? Is there a book in the drawer somewhere, um, the proverbial drawer? Um, um, the, the book your that's computer. in the drawer before this one will stay in the drawer and no one will ever look at it. It is, no, that was a practice. <laughs> But it's like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, the, she didn't want that one found, and it was still, you know, the sequel. <laughs> like, so they felt so like, strongly that they shouldn't have done that because I, too, have a novel I want no one to read. I'm like, I hope no one does that to me. I know. <laughs> could always destroy it. Here's a really good idea. You know, it never, I've actually spent a lot of time back from my lawyer days in reminding authors that everyone should have a literary executor with very clear instructions, because if you don't do that, you're fair game. But if you truly have something you don't ever want to see published, you know, an excellent thing to do would be to destroy it. So there were a lot of terrible legal questions hanging around the To Kill the Mockingbird and the, and the book that was finally published and it never should have happened. But, you know, there we go. I wanted to ask you two questions before we go mm -hmm. on. One is, um, when you were looking at the Babington letters or the code and so forth, it's almost impossible for today for a person not trained to actually read secretary hand. I mean, you know, to read an Elizabethan document is, it's like reading code in the first place or some other <laughs> strange language. So did you, you know, did you work with original documents? Did you look at, at modern translations or did you need to at all? You just needed to know that they existed. Um, mostly what I worked with was transcribed versions of the originals. I didn't have access to the actual files. I could see scanned versions from the British Library and things like that. But mm -hmm. the, the wonderful part of online archives is that most things like that have been 
done into searchable text. And so you can just kind of scroll through them and, and read the bits that are important and not have to worry about whether that S is really an F. But I absolutely yeah. agree with you. The few times I did try to read the actual documents or compare it against them, I it, it takes an hour to read half a page. It's exhausting. <laughs> Right, and yeah, you're not, you're not even sure, you, <laughs> you yeah. don't even know for sure you got the words right, so no, it's tough. Um, did you, have you had an opportunity to spend time in London before the pandemic? I'm assuming that you were able to go there. Um, did you, you know, visit any, well, uh, sorry, any um, Kit Marlowe sites, so to speak? Did you go to the tavern at Deptford? I've actually been there. There's a wonderful um, water service, um, water bus service that goes from Greenwich all the way down, and I've ridden it many, many times. And one day I finally got off at Deptford and I thought, you know, might as well go see. Um, and it's so interesting to me that people still talk about Christopher Marlowe and, you know, and what happened, the bill um, in, in Deptford. But did you have a chance to see it yourself? I did spend some time in London um, toward the beginning part of writing this book. It was kind of like I had had an idea in the back of my mind and then that trip kind of helped me develop it into an actual outline for the book. Um, I did do some wandering around. I took a day trip to Canterbury so I could wander through the streets where he grew up and that was a great delight to me. Um, I saw the the grave marker for Marlowe in Deptford and funny, I had a friend who was living in London at the time that I was trying to sell this book. She's since moved, but when we were waiting to hear back from an editor whether the Marlowe book would sell or not, she went to get Marlowe's grave and just like put out a little good Ooh, wish for me. <laughs> so, nice, nice. It worked. That's it really did. nice. I thank her for that. <laughs> yeah, well, among his other qualities, he was a real brawler. You know, he reminds me a lot of Caravaggio. I don't know why I was reading some essay or something. There must be a new book out about Caravaggio or something. And the two of them, I thought, had a lot in common despite their separation in time. And, you know, they were incredibly talented, but they were also. unexpectedly early and um, um, unnecessary deaths, really, if you think about it. Um, I mean, 29, how much can you do by the time you're 29? But Marlowe managed to accomplish just a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that wasn't a question. It was more an observation. Back to Suzanne. No, I think about that all the time. What could he have done with another 29 years? Oh, yeah. I think about that with Mozart, you know, I often thought if, you know, if I had the power to bring like a person back, I would bring back Mozart because he was just hitting his stride when he died. And, yeah. you know, I think about the magic flute and then I think about what might have come afterward and I just want to weep. But yeah, I think Marlowe and, you know, did you, do you have any thoughts about whether Shakespeare was Marlowe or whether Marlowe actually wrote? That's one of those great Shakespearean things that goes on all the time. How much of it, how much Shakespeare might have been Marlowe? Or Shakespeare's sister was Marlowe, right? Or whatever. Yeah, I know. There are any number of candidates for Shakespeare, <laughs> aside from Shakespeare. But one of the enduring ones is certainly that Marlowe might have, um, you know, written not all of Shakespeare, but certainly some of it. Did you run into that while you were writing this? Constantly. Every time I tell somebody that I'm writing a book about Marlowe, they're like, oh, does he survive at the end and become Shakespeare? And it's... <laughs> There I'm was a book I'm somebody about the book to share my loud opinions about yeah. that question. There is actually a novel, a mystery, I think, and I can't for the life of me remember what it is. But that is the thesis of it: that the whole death mm -hmm. in Deptford was staged, and Marlowe escaped to France and then came back and you know carried on as Shakespeare. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. Ross Barber wrote a book like that, the Marlowe Papers. That was yeah, that I think you're right. I think it was the Marlowe Papers, yeah. right? Right. That one's a beautiful book. Uh, really, really well written. Um, and, and imagine my book is not a Marlowe becomes Shakespeare book because that is the one conspiracy theory that gets under my skin and drives me crazy. <laughs> I am a loud Marlowe and Shakespeare were two different people uh, proponent, and I, I mean, the reason that I always give is if you read Marlowe's plays and Shakespeare's plays side by side, the things that interested them as playwrights are so different, and their styles are so different. Like, obviously, you have to account for. Uh, Shakespeare lived twice as long as Marlowe did, so your interests and your writing style will evolve as you get older. But just they they have such different personalities to me. And there there was a lot of news that came out five or six years ago about the scandal that Marlowe's hand was found in Henry the Sixth. They thought that some of his 
writing might have been attributed to Shakespeare and that everyone thought that was the reason that maybe Marlowe and Shakespeare were the same person. But mm. Elizabethan playwrights were so collaborative at the time anyway that everyone wrote with everyone. Everyone shared ideas. Everyone picked up a line here or there from another person. It's like the TV's write, TV writer's room of the 16th century. That's just mm. a little... <laughs> That's a nice analogy. I like that. They're very, very different. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think that, that makes a, I think a pretty strong case. I, I, I like that, that they had different focus and that's pretty clear mm -hmm. that, I mean, that that's, you, you've already convinced me <laughs> to become people, I'll take Great, it. I could go on for another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious, you know, actually just generally about like other, you know, as you were doing either your research or, you know, what were some of the other things that you, you maybe learned um, in the process of writing the book? Um, were there other things that maybe didn't get into the book? Or, you know, what kind of, you know, historical things also intrigued you? Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time researching the history of the Church of England for this book. And so mm -hmm. this could have been a 700 page book that just follows the religious turmoils of the time. Um, it, that sounds very dry when you say it out loud, but the oh. The way that that happened, and it was so dramatic, and there was so much underhand scheming to try and get the religion that you believed in on the throne. It was that was the drama of the time, and so there's there's so and when you think about it, the state religion changed so many times. Mm -hmm. Every time a new queen or king came to the throne, basically for seventy years, the religion would flip, and so it was just such a turbulent and interesting time. There's there's so many stories in that that could have been included that to really force myself to say no this is this is a Marlowe book and we can't we can't go on for for 70 years about the Church of England but yeah no I mean and obviously those religious wars don't really end uh, you know in, in that time I mean they keep going but um, um, I mean I, one of the questions actually I want to go back to something I was kind of asking you about before um, you know about your this uh, well one how long did this take you but I'm also just curious um, you know, what has surprised you so far about publishing your first novel? I mean, what has anything surprised you about this journey or like you're still new in this? So what, what, do you, what have you learned? Yeah. yeah, no, I think the answers to both those questions are kind of the same because the thing that surprises me the most is how long everything takes. Yeah. <laughs> we have a very glamorous view in the media of what it's like to publish a book is that you sell it and then in two weeks it's on shelves and you wrote it in a weekend and it's done. Mm -hmm. um, I started writing A Tip to the Hangman in 2013 mm -hmm. and it released last week. So that mm -hmm. was a, a good seven or eight years of rewriting and thinking about and analyzing and then pitching and then selling and then rewriting and then promoting. It's It's a marathon to get mm -hmm. a book out into the world and I think writers kind of learn that as, as they publish their first book, but it's not it's not talked about all that much until you're doing it. And then, then you're just kind of struck by, oh my goodness, I have so much to do and it's going to take so long. Mm -hmm. And was that, so was the writing process for you sort of, I mean, you know you have a good day job and stuff, like were you, was it kind of fits and starts or were you like on the weekend or like were you pretty much, I gotta work on this every day or like what was that like for you? Uh, it definitely wasn't every day. Day. It was every day when I was on a deadline, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, and as I kind of settled into the day job routine, I used to be a morning writer, so you'd get 30, 45 minutes in before you have to catch the train and go down to the office. So that was my routine. But there were also some months where I, I think of them as thinking months, where there was a problem that I had to solve. And I, I couldn't really sit down and write it. I didn't know what the answer was. I had to just kind of let mm -hmm. it percolate for a while. And I guess that's, that's still working. That's still writing. It just doesn't mm -hmm. always feel like it. Mm -hmm. And then how was the actual, so um, so you finished it, you went on submission, so tell us a little bit about the, like, the publishing end of that journey, like that you got an agent, like what, what was the exciting, how did it get to here, how are we now at this moment? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm really, really lucky to have the agent that I have, she saw a draft of the book that wasn't quite what we then sent out on submission to editors, it still had some make it work and she she had a lot of faith in me as a writer who's never sold a book before so mm -hmm. thanks Bridget you're great <laughs> <laughs> yay Bridget good job Bridget <laughs> it's wonderful so then we went out on on submission and we were on it felt like a very long time again I don't really have a good metric for how long these things take for other people but we were on submission for for quite a while you know some people would say you know this is great we just we already bought something like this or something like that so you know it's, it's a 
complicated marketing process as much as much as it is is the book ready it's also you know does this fit our list right now exactly. so we i think we found the perfect home for it once it did find a home though so mm-hmm. i got i got the call that we got a book deal while i was at my office in between meetings sitting at my desk and we had kind of an open office floor plan so i had to really really try not to interrupt <laughs> the guy having a call right next to me but i was like all right i'm gonna try not to yell too loud yeah no i think that moment when you kind of hear that's pretty exciting um i mean and, you know so hopefully you're kind of capturing and then you have your first when all the things that are the first the first uh you know edits which may not always be fun but the first uh you know all like seeing the cover you know all that stuff how did you come up with the title by the way or did you come up with the title was that a marketing choice or did you do it um it was one of the titles that i proposed to the team mm-hmm. um again we queried it under a different title um, so we, we kind of brainstormed together what would be the best way to, to sell this book. And I really love the one that we landed on. Um, it's be, I mean, the, the reason that I love it the most is that at heart, I am a person who is sold by a good pun. And so this mm-hmm. title kind of has a double meaning and that delights me. Mm-hmm. Um, if we, for the way I explain it is a tip for the hangman is one kind of a tip of information that you give that's going to lead someone to the hangman, essentially espionage. You learn the fact that that leads to somebody's death. But also at this time, one of my favorite weird historical facts is that when someone was going to the gallows to be hanged, they were expected to actually pay the executioner for doing the job of killing them right before their death. They would have to hand over a few coins to the hangman in order to be executed. And so I kind of like the the fatality of that, the kind of, weird catch-22 of it all and so that's oh yeah it's like bringing your news your own news to the hanging or you know like with mine um because i studied murder ballads that's actually what my background is <laughs> um but uh, you know us morbid people will like it yes um, but you know yeah that or they'd um they'd pay uh for like boys to come and hang on people's legs to pull them so that it would be quicker <laughs> i mean it's so morbid it's so awful but you know you've got to make sure terrible execution stories well yeah that's exactly it i mean you know it was yeah. mary queen of scots that had the pretty botched execution right well, like they kept ac- going after her <laughs> it was pretty yes. terrible yeah it took several times <laughs> and then was yeah, there so- to thomas cromwell like 50 years before that was just as bad because the executioner yeah, was drunk it's it's you gotta awful. pay those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, do you all, or, um, do you all know? Like, could oh, I just ahead. interrupt yeah, for ahead, a second yeah. while we're yeah, talking yeah. about the hangman? Do you know <laughs> that the Canada's version of the Edgars, the the award tier for mystery writers, is called the Arthur Ellis Award, and Arthur Ellis was the pseudonym for the Canada's hangman. So oh. up until this year, the award was actually a gallows in a noose <laughs> at all. Um, so the hangman has certainly made his presence felt um, over time. But they often, um, it, it could be a family position. I mean, they often it had a, a, a fake name, so to speak, because, you know, um, they got to keep the clothes, if I remember right. Yeah. There were perks mm-hmm. for the hangman, like the clothes. And um, mm-hmm. hanging could go really badly. So you're right about, you know, they would sometimes pay people or relatives would you know, grab onto their knees to hoping to break their neck before they strangled because strangling is really a miserable death. Although they are very alienated figures, as you can, I mean, actually, my, that's my next book is about a, a hangman. Is it? It's sort of like this, this sort of sad tale of a, and actually mine might be called something similar. We were just talking about this today with my editor. So I'm <laughs> a little afraid to tell you that it, um, that it might be called the, the cry of the hangman. I was like, but that sounds a lot like a tip for the hangman. <laughs> There's a Bavarian series. I can't remember the name of the author. It's Oliver something. I'll think of it. But anyway, it starts out with the hangman's daughter. Um, and it's a, it's a, might be 17th century Bavarian, I think. Um, but anyway, you know, what it's like to be the daughter of the hangman and all of the, all of the things that introduces into her life. But you know, it was a it was a necessary job if you in an age of serious capital punishment. Yeah, <laughs> definitely an archetypal figure of the period. It it, just, it yeah, was, it really was. Susanna, before we move to questions, why don't you tell us a little bit about your January book, your most recent Lucy Campion, or the whole series? You might give us just a bit of background about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, my books are these Lucy Campion mysteries are set in seventeenth century London and. 
Uh, they feature Lucy, who was initially a chambermaid in the house of a magistrate who becomes over time a bookseller's apprentice. Um, and this is set during the time of um, the Great Plague or the Plague and the Great Fire of London. So the Devil's Year 666, um, 1666. And so it's sort of each time there's, uh, you know, a little of murder, a mystery, but it's, uh, you know, continuing characters. So the Sign of the Gallows was just released um, and it is uh, sort of a story. Actually, some, yeah, Lucy comes across um, a man who has been found hanged at a gallows and um, a hanging tree. Um, and mystery ensues. <laughs> and the next one, which I literally just turned in today, I cannot tell you, it was crazy. The next one um, is coming out uh, next February. So the cry, cry of a Hangman, ten tentatively titled, um, if I'm allowed to keep that title. But, um, so I know I, I, I know we, we may have audience questions, but I did want to ask Allison also, maybe this will be the last question. Like, but what? what oh, take you your think? time. We're not under oh, yeah. any time yeah. limit okay. at all. I am wondering about like what is next for you in terms of like historical, um, you know, are you or are you writing something different or like what's, what's what are you thinking about? Yeah, uh, I think historical fiction is my happy place, and so definitely the project that I'm working on next is also set, you know, a couple hundred years back. I'm looking at a different, different uh, socio political problem area. I think that's that's Ooh. the kind of stories that really appeal to me as a time where everything in society is like kind of hanging on a thread a little bit yeah. so a time, a time i can't talk period. too much about it because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's not done and my editor hasn't read it so <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, no a clue. small amount of secrecy but it is kind of still in the uh historical drama thriller space nice i was gonna say say it to me in coded language and i'll decipher <laughs> it and, <laughs> and i'll be the I'll only one that knows. yeah use the babington code and and then i'll figure it out <laughs> Oh, that's exciting. That's great. Congratulations on the another one on the horizon. That's um, I know you have to write it and all. Or well, yeah. you have you have written it or it's in the process. I have written so. a draft and a half. So we're in the revisions process. Oh, I think that's done. <laughs> that's you awesome. know, I wish it was. That would be much more helpful than what I'm trying to do right now. No, for sure. It'll get done. And I don't know if we if there are some questions. Let me Charles, let me like, call where Patrick, are you over there? I have to summon back our staff because <laughs> he's doing the Facebook thing while I'm talking to you. Here he comes. Questions? Um, yeah. Not too many questions. Uh, let's see. One of them, uh, it's a question for Allison is, do you have a favorite chapter? Mm. Yes. I was just talking about this to somebody who, who messaged me this morning that they got to my favorite chapter. So, <laughs> I can sort of, I think the reason it's my favorite is it's not super essential to the plot. This is just a moment for the character to kind of breathe and so I can talk about it somewhat. It's about the the midpoint of the book. Uh, Marlowe is kind of catching his breath in between spy escapades and the chapter is right after he debuts a new play in London. It goes really well. Everybody loves what he's written and he's just kind of uh, celebrating his success at a tavern with his theater crowd. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of terrible things that happen tomorrow in this book. So my favorite part was when something finally went right for him. <laughs> it was really lovely to spend some time with him in a good moment. And it was also kind of the, that was the part of the world that was my entry point into the Marlowe story, the theater and the, the uh, art scene of it all. And so it was a lot of fun for me to kind of play around in that, see all of my favorite Elizabethan theater characters in the same scene kind of having a night out together <laughs> that's fun I, actually I have a question for for both of you which is um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of writing uh, dialogue uh, you know in your particular historical periods and how do you I mean obviously how do you try try to keep it as authentic as possible um, while still making it readable for a modern audience that's probably got to be a, a challenge and um, do you find yourself uh, having to, in the editing process, having to, to excise, you know, just modern phrases that subtly work their way into the, into the work? Yes. Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I think for me, I, the, the litmus test that I had when I was writing dialogue, I think I, other historical authors will have their own opinions on what's too modern to fit in a historical novel, and I'm sure, Susie, you have your opinions as well, but for me, 
Um, I just didn't want anything that jumps out aggressively as modern. I was okay with some words that had been used, you know, some words that might not have been period appropriate. I was okay with fudging things a little bit in order to make the characters feel alive and have them be engaging and have the personalities come through. But if a phrase came out that sounded like something someone would say at a Starbucks waiting for their coffee, that that I did not want to be distracting in any so, way. So they wouldn't say, my um, bad, for instance. <laughs> Say what? Say my sorry? bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there were a few my copy editor underlined. It was like, I, I think you might think this doesn't sound modern, but it does, and it's distracting. So I, that is why I definitely uh, condone getting someone else to read over your work and be a second judgment when you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, I found it, you know, trying, trying to, sp- I mean, I was maybe the other way around when I, I started, when I first wrote my first book, um, A Murder at Rosemans Gate, I was like, I'm going to write it all in a completely Elizabeth, or, you know, well, it was like Stuart English. Um, and, it, you know, and it's like, oh, uh, within like two pages, not even one page, I was like, mm, this is not going to work. Like, uh, so I, I went with that sort of, you know, trying to sprinkle in language. And, um, but I will say that I think I did, I'm sure something snuck by, like, okay. But I was like, well, you know, there was probably versions of okay, like, you know, um, but I will say switching back and forth between my other series that I write in 1920 Chicago, um, I it was a little challenging going back. I swear, like I, I caught myself talking about people sitting on their stoop, you know, which they don't have stoops in 17th century London. Um, so I had to recatch some anachronisms um, and strange, strange words. Um, but uh, yeah. I have a um, question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I have a question for you, actually, um, from Diane, who asks, she says, your two series are so different. Which era do you prefer to write and research? <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a good question. I mean, it's hard because I love them both. But, you know, 17, that's where I have my dis- that doctorates from. You know, my graduate research is, you know, so I really feel very comfortable in 17th century. But it was super fun to go to 1920 Chicago. I mean, that's all speakeasies and cocktails. And I will say the research just really quickly is different because, you know, I really did do like, oh, I'm going to research cocktails and music and fun things were my, so it was like sort of more flippant um, research, but super fun. And then researching my 17th century stuff was probably a little more like reading all the, all the you know, crazy things about hangmen and all that stuff, but it was, you know, a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little more literary bound maybe, but um they're both fun. I mean, it's like picking kids, you know. I enjoy both writing both. But it was actually surprisingly easy, mostly to jump back into Lucy's world, which I did not expect to be able to do. Um, but the another uh, place picked up these series, so I was able to continue them. But it's a little challenging. So, Allison, when you get to that second book, it'll be really interesting when you're still promoting and talking about this book, um, and then you're t- then you're going to start thinking about the other one, and you're going to be like, what? Which time period am I talking yeah, about? <laughs> I was going to say, for writing in the in the 1920s, though, for in a certain way, it must be a little bit easier to find sources just because their records aren't so old and lost. I was just thinking of what it would be like to try and find a list of cocktails in 1580, and that was horrifying. Oh, so. oh I know. And I did learn the hard way that I had the wrong, that Whigs and Tories did not drink the same thing. I learned after a few books that, yeah, they, they, they drink sherry or they drink port and it's a political affiliation. So I was like, oh man, I wish I had known that with my first book, but you know, nobody else probably knows that, so it's okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was definitely, um, you know, how you think about the, um, it's, in, you know, it's easier in some ways to like get YouTube stuff, but I was able to figure out how a printing press worked by watching a YouTube video. So, mm-hmm. you know, so there's, there's a lot of, and a lot of, as you say, our sources have been, I mean, English sources are amazingly available. I mean, even when I started doing research as a grad student, I had to use, you know, uh, microfiche machines and all that microfilm uh, <laughs> pre-internet. And, uh, you know, now it's, just, you know, so much has been put up online. I can just sit on my living room sofa and do research that way. Yeah. Not to just keep riffing on your answers, but YouTube as a historical research source is the best unsung secret of historical novelists. I've watched so many YouTube videos that are just hot. How do you light a fire? What happens to a candle after you burn it for seven hours? There's a oh, video yeah. for everything. How do you make soap? I mean, I was like, oh, this is so helpful. I have a soap maker in my book. I did. Oh, and then there's the, I think, have you seen the uh, the Agus map, the, the Momo map, which is the map, it's the interactive map of London um, yes. from, the, from the 16th century pre-fire, well, all pre-fire, of course. It's amazing. It's so incredible. Yeah. I sent it to my copy editor and I said, I need you to know about this because it's so wonderful. Yeah, that, so some of our stuff is quite good. I mean, that's mm-hmm. also really nice. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's more questions. I had one last question for you, Allison, because, you know, a lot of times there's, um, you know, aspiring writers um, who are on, you know, who watch and like, like to learn in these kinds of events. Um, do you have any advice for, um, you know, for writers, um, you know, of fiction or, you know, aspiring novelists? I mean, like, what would you suggest to them or recommend that they think about that you've now learned? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think something that's become more and more clear to me lately, especially this past wacky year, is that having a group of writing friends specifically is so important if you want to do, if you want to write seriously. Having someone that you can send a chapter to and say, hey, I know there's something wrong with this, but I don't know what it is, and just getting a second pair of eyes. Or if you just need someone to complain about the writing process, to having somewhere that you can just be tired of edit being hard. I think a lot of new writers see writing as something that's very personal and very private, something that you do alone with the door closed and you don't speak to anybody about it until it's ready. And you can certainly write like that, but I think it's much harder to sustain excitement in your own work when you're doing it by yourself and no one's looking at it and it's only hard all the time. So having yeah. people that you can get excited about stuff with is so helpful to keep you going when it's when it's hard, because sometimes it is. Yeah, and I think it's really important to also just share that with people because I think sometimes writers, it's understandable, you look at all the published books in the bookstore and you're like, oh, they're all, you know, and nobody comes out. I mean, there might be the Mozart equivalent of, uh, you know, writers who, who can write a perfect first draft, but most people can't, you know, and that they don't know that it takes, you know, 20, 30 drafts sometimes to get to like where you are when it's a published book. and. That's one thing I always try to like remind people that it, it takes time. And, and, you know, my first book took me over 10 years to write because I was just like, oh, today you're writing a book. Um, but I, you know, it didn't, it didn't like just pop out. You know? no. so, <laughs> I mean, it takes time. So. Yeah. And even if the first draft no, pops first out, that does not mean that's the last. <laughs> that might not be the good draft. Yeah. Nope. Patrick has another question. Yeah, yeah. I have a question from uh, Karen Oden, who's a historical uh, novelist as well. And she says, okay. uh, this is more about Kit Marlowe, the person, rather than the character. But do you have a sense for how his experience as a spy, amidst intrigue and religious upheaval, shaped his shaped his works? Uh, she said, "I don't remember the Jew of Malta that well, but I remember lots of intrigue and betrayal." Hmm. Yes, this is something that I found super interesting while I was writing. Obviously, I did the, the full deep dive into Marlowe's plays while I was writing. There aren't that many of them. Fortunately, I think there's six. So you can get through them in a weekend but there's so much intrigue and betrayal and secret keeping in a lot of these plays the jew of malta for sure and also the massacre at paris which is kind of a it seems like it wasn't quite finished when he did it but it's really based in the religious upheaval in france maybe 30 years before the time i set my book so he's very clearly thinking about the way that religion and politics are are interweaving um and then just kind of a the theme that I keep noticing repeatedly throughout all of Marlowe's plays, and I think it's kind of his hallmark, is just how unforgivingly violent they are. I think if you're spending time as a spy in such a high stakes environment where a single mistake can cost you your life, it's not it's not entirely surprising that the plays are kind of saturated with with violence and death and conquest. That's very much the political mood of the time. I mean Tamburlaine was his first play, and at the time, his most popular, people couldn't get enough of it. And essentially, the plot of Tamburlaine is uh, a shepherd comes in to a new kingdom and kills all of the kings one by one. That's kind of how it goes for five acts. So, you, and, and you, you can really tell he's working through these questions of power and of succession and that sort of thing, but it, in a very dramatic way that would not get you in any trouble with the royal censor when you're putting them out on the stage. Yeah, well, he, he had, you know, probably knew about Henry Tudor and his Henry the Seventh and his path to power. So, you know, sure. I have to say that you know I never gotten over reading Catherine by Anya Seton, which is like my favorite historical novel for forever, um, and. You know, they, I mean, the way it gave birth to all of these centuries of controversy, familial controversy and so forth is fascinating. So I understand, Allison, why Marlowe would have triggered off your interest in, in you know, writing about him and so forth. But um, have you considered not being English centric, but maybe writing a different, you know, a different 
country, a different time or so forth. We're seeing a I lot have. more books in translation from other countries. And I wonder, because, you know, obviously research materials in English would be the easiest for you to work with, but um, there are now translations, so you could wander into the Swedish archives or anything else you felt like. Absolutely. I will give the little tease to my project in progress, which is set in Russia. So I am ah. venturing out of, and, I'm, and it's funny that you say uh, sources in translation, because I am leaning heavily on translated sources and secondary sources for this. I'm also trying to teach myself Russian so I can read the primary oh, sources. Wow, that's that really impressive. really hard. So give yeah. me 40 years and I'll be able to read a single right. paragraph. I was going to say, I like it as a procrastination technique. Oh, I really have to learn like Russian. I have to learn the before. language before I can write chapter three. That's kind of how it started. I will, I will I said, tell oh, you. I'm just going to be like, so is it Lenin related? No, no, I won't. I won't pull out anything more. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe people ask you now, like they do me, um, is there a crossover possible from your books? Because even though mine are 17th century London and, you know, 1920 Chicago, Gina is my other character. They're like, well, she must be like the great, great, great granddaughter of Lucy. And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so have that in your background, you know, that there's some it's sort of time travel and I'm open to both. <laughs> exactly. This has really been a fun discussion, ladies. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you, Allison, my favorite phrase from Russian, which I did study at Stanford. And you'll you'll be interested to know that my professor was a white Russian who had come to San Francisco from Vladivostok and therefore had survived the revolution. In his free time, he taught profanity at the Army. happy to know uh, or determined to need to know how to swear authentically if they were dropped into Russia, which if you think about it, makes perfectly good sense. Absolutely. Anyway, okay, I can so. still remember, so you figure that one out. It's a very useful phrase to have when you're it trying to learn Russian. <laughs> Basically, it means I understand nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so on that aside. note, um, thank you to Karen Auden, um, who has agreed to do a Victorian program for us um, on April 16th with Will Thomas right after Ann Perry. So I'm going to have them in succession. That ought to be a a lot of fun for you fans of history um and karen i think Susanna, did you move to crooked lane do i remember that right uh, no, well Min minotaur was the first set of those um and then uh, severn house oh severn right okay i knew you'd change but i couldn't remember which anyway thank you for your time um and let me encourage you to order a copy after this great discussion you can see why i say that of a tip for the hangman um, which will be wandering in from the snow-covered lake michigan frontage, whatever it is, uh, or maybe you live out west in Chicago. Anyway, thanks very much, ladies. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. And so much. thank all of you. I, we thank all of you for watching us today. And do tell your friends. Um, and there's a podcast of this that'll be available for people who don't want to sit in front of a screen. And eventually, Patrick will put this on YouTube. So we have multiple channels for people to enjoy our programs. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.